talk about the future of robotics manipulation with open source. So please go ahead, Tyler. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we are the uh, the people behind the library Move It, but uh, more generally, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the history of robotic manipulation and lead you into kind of like where we are now and and what um, what we're doing in this field. Um, if I can. Um, so. The big deal with robotic arms right now is logistics. Um, these are just some of the companies doing things. It's a lot of pick and place in sorting facilities and warehouses and stuff like that. It's kind of the, the new hotness with manipulation. Um, but a, a real uh, basic question when you think about like, where is the robotic manipulation? Um, in most cases, uh, the best robotic companies are ones that are getting rid of the robot like the robotic aren't robotic arms are really hard and various companies are finding mechanical solutions to do similar things so here's an example um flippy and creator um they're both companies that are creating robots for uh making hamburgers and um one is building an entire mechanical system creator for the whole process and the other one flippy is they're um they're they're building a robotic arm simply just to flip burgers um another example um is making coffee um many of you have probably seen robots um resemble the one on the right the one on the left is a company from the cafe x it's a company of the bay area, bay area i think that is trying to use a robotic arm for making coffee. Um, but what was it, what's what's the real dream of of uh, robotic manipulation? And th that is a multi-purpose robot. It's not a, a does one thing like the coffee robot or the hamburger flipping robot. It's it's really um, it's really a general purpose robot that can do all sorts of things. Um, so background on robotic manipulation, um, there's this is sort of the history of what's been important in different time periods. There's, uh, example of the, the Puma industrial arms in the sixties, and then teach pendants were a big deal. Um, teach pendants are still a big deal. They, that's how you train is the term they often use to uh, you you put the robot in a state where you can manipulate it by hand and develop some canned motion that you can repeat over and over to do some task um 80s machine vision started to become a thing and the 90s pc based control um and 2011 ish now ish cobots are a big deal cobots really just robots that operate in a collaborative space with humans. Um, so where have robot arms been really successful? The past few decades, they've been really successful in large scale manufacturing. Um, in those cases, you're often just doing the same thing over and over in a really controlled environment. So where, what, what, what is next? We see the future as being mobile manipulation or sort of the next frontier. Um, that is some form of manipulation with some form of mobile base. Um, here are three example robots. Um, some of you have probably seen. So robotic arms. Robotic arms, from our perspective, is a, is a real emerging market, and it is an amazing place to be. Um, I see it as a market that is just taking off. Um, so... How, how how do we get robot arms out of the factory? How do we do things with robot arms that are not just canned routines that you execute over and over again? Um, and where is Rosie the robot, really? Uh, where's the the general robot, the robot that just does, um, that can do general tasks? Uh, right now, it seems that robots are, are mostly used in highly structured environments. Um, or, and we want to get them beyond highly structured. So 
what's preventing it? It's hardware costs. Hardware is really expensive. It comes to robotics. Uh, software capabilities. In many cases, the software. Um, I mean, it's just a really new market, and the software isn't very mature in a lot of ways. Uh, safety concerns. It's it's not just concerns. It's it's there are real issues with safety in robotics, and it takes a lot of work to make a robot uh, safe to operate around humans. Uh, robot manip- mobility. Um, humans are incredibly dexterous, and when you try to uh, do some task that humans do uh, almost intuitively with a robot, you regularly ri- run into all these situations you hadn't thought of. Um, a real basic example is just joint constraints for certain types of movements um, and then lack of standardization. There's a lot of people doing their own thing. So uh, go into a little bit more detail of those various things. Hardware costs, um, there are ways we can get the cost down, economies of scale. Um, but one of the big problems is like, for robotics to be really useful, oftentimes they require really high precision parts and those are expensive and difficult to manufacture and then different, then you have to calibrate them. Um, and you have to have software that can account for all the uh, mechanical attributes of the part. It's, it's much more complicated than a lot of mechanical devices. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and in the end, humans have great closed loop control. Humans are actually really good and dexterous at doing tasks and building mechanical systems to do them is, is hard. Um, software. Um, it's software is not well designed to deal with things like partial occlusions and cluttered environments and nonlinear motions and, um, Reasoning about unpredictable situations is 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 still really hard and kind of an unsolved problem. So, um, safety. Um, these are just some like simple examples are e- easy to think of more. Um, and there, are, in many cases, you can m- create structured environments. Um, you can modify the environment in a way where the robot works to mitigate safety um and that's one of the really common approaches another common approach is building robots that are just kind of inherently safe and the robot vacuum is a great example of something that's just kind of mechanic or inherently safe like the way it's designed it, it it like mechanically can't do much harm so that means that you don't have to worry about this one as much in in that case that's a great example for it uh mobility um, go back to the robot vacuum. Uh, navigating stairs is not a thing that anybody's robot vacuum does. Um, and yet many people's homes and apartments have stairs in them. Um, humans are really good at navigating stairs. Stairs were designed for humans, not for, not really for, uh, wheeled robots. So there are legged robots. They're, uh, immensely more complicated and more co- and more costly. Um, so, yeah, there's all sorts of reasons. Um, lack of standardization. So, every robot manufacturer seems to have their own um, software standard. Uh, software standard, and it reminds me that the XKCD joke, where like everybody's like, "We'll create another standard to unify them all," and you just have one more standard. Um, the reason they do this is for vendor lock-in, but it, it, it really, in our perspective, it, it's really slowed the, um, the progress of the technology than the real cost here. So why do current solutions not address the, the Rosie problem? I'm, I've been giving you some, but go more specific, uh, off the shelf hardware, um, the programming environments for off the shelf hardware is really restrictive, right? They're often designed around specific tasks that the creator of the hardware 
like envision the robot doing like currently the area where robots are really successful or, or arm robots are really successful is in these repetitive manufacturing tasks. So a lot of the off the shelf hardware is really designed around doing repetitive um, tasks. And so the programming environments are just designed for helping you do that. They don't, they don't enable general solutions. Um, and then, yeah, software licensing. I mean, we're, uh, we're talking about um, open source software here and software licensing is a big problem with uh, standardization. So uh, existing software frameworks, um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, they, going back to this thing, they, they, uh, they don't offer much flexibility because the creators of them envision like the current applications for robots as their only target customers. Um, and they're just difficult to work with. So yeah, this is just more of the, like from the hardware side, the hardware is really designed around industrial reliability and robustness and um, the needs of non-experts to be able to like make canned motions. Um, and so it's really hard to use a lot of the current hardware and software um, to do more general things. So this is where we're at, where it's, it's um, because robots are designed for the end user and the end user really being factories. Um, it's hard to use them for uh, novel tasks. So an alternative approach. This is this is really just the pitch of like who we are as Picnic and what are we doing about this. Um, we're involved with Ross. You've been hearing a lot from uh, other people who are involved in Ross. It's um, it's a open source standard with a good license uh, um, for robotic software and there's no vendor lock-in and it it offers interoperability like the different the different components you use in building software is oftentimes very hardware agnostic so it solves a very specific problem and it's composable uh, and it's really built around these uh, sort of just developing open standards for the software that everybody seems to write um, yeah, so robust general purpose robot hard, software is hard to write. And it it means that um, really one of the best ways to achieve this general purpose robot software is with a lot of input from many different people in, in different industries even who um, bring their problems and help develop a general solution that is um works well it's sort of the beauty of the, the open source model in a lot of ways um why should you pay attention to ross well it reduces cost because a lot of the work is already done um it's easier to hire talent to work on your project if you're using ross because it is developed enough of a life of its own that there are if you need people to build robot software, there's a lot of people who already really like Ross and already really understand it. And there's an active community to support people and, and to find people in. Um, it helps with tech transfer from academia. Uh, there's a lot of people who are doing research who are using Ross because in the same way that enables innovation from in companies, it enables innovation in research. Um, and it's built on top of industry standards. The latest version of ROS, ROS2, is um, built on middleware that's based on DDS, which is a uh, an industry standard for uh, middleware. So big companies are standardizing on ROS. Um, there's a really impressive steering committee. Um, we are honored to be part of it. 
Um, and then there's several consortias that have been established also Ross Industrial that really does deal with industrial applications of Ross. Um, Auto Aware, which is the uh, people are building self-driving car like things based on Ross. And then the movement community, which is us. Um, so how Ross is helping us achieve the next level of robotic capabilities. Um, it's helping commoditize hardware in that it defines abstractions for hardware and interfaces to hardware that are standard um, and allows you to write software that's agnostic of hardware and can compare hardware. And then once you actually get hardware, it, or, or if you change what hardware you're using, it's easy to swap out. Um, there's just more software capability and it's all um, nicely integrated. There's uh, robot mobil mobility. So uh, Navigation 2 is another huge project in the Ross world. And um, that really helps with mobile robots. Um, and it solves the lack of standardization problem um, in that ROS is a open standard in a lot of ways. And it's, it's, it's really pretty straightforward and universal. Um, except it's accelerating robotics innovation, right? Uh, there's an image from Fetch. Um, there's hundreds of startups. Um, there's a lot of research papers. There's hundreds of millions of dollars in company valuations that are based on Ross. Um, so, uh, when is this not a solution for you? Like, why would you like what? In what cases would you not? Would you not follow this? It's, if you if you don't need to customize things very well, or like you don't you don't have any really specific needs, if the current solutions meet your needs really well, um, if you're not building a robot product yourself, um, and uh, you don't care about owning the IP, and then lastly, you don't have an expert development team. One of the real costs of uh, developing or one of the hardest costs to deal with of developing uh, robotic applications um, that are novel is that you do need a really uh, professional development team. Um, let me ask, what about my company's IP, right? You want to build something um, and sell it and you want to, you're concerned about protecting your IP. Um, you don't, have to give it away. Um, Non-competitive contributions are greatly encouraged. It's it's encouraged that companies that are building stuff on top of Ross when they uh, that they upstream as much as they can. Um, yeah, Ross is not copy left, so you can build proprietary software on top of Ross. Um, you can build a, a a fork of Ross itself if you wanted to, and and sell it. Um, the yeah, you, you can focus on just like what your core value is, what your competitive advantage is, and not on having to build all the infrastructure because a lot of it's done for you if you use Ross. Uh, so what is MoveIt? MoveIt is the thing that I'm here to talk to you about. I give you this introduction to Ross and robotics. Um, it's a motion planning platform. Um, it started as a project called Arm Navigation and then change names over time and now we're on move it to move it to really just signifies like move it that works on ross too um and that's that's getting much more mature it's it's several years old now and um it's where a lot of the new development is happening um it's incredible how 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 long it's kind of thing um what 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 does move it help you with move it is really about uh, robotic arm manipulation. It helps with motion planning. Um, it combines all sorts of different kinds of planners. So in in an abstract way, so we talked about hardware as an abstraction, right? You can swap out hardware and it's it's straightforward. Well, you can swap out planners with MoveIt. It's pretty straightforward. Um, a bunch of different collision checkers. 
um, inverse kinematics, manipulation, grasping, control, 3D perception. Um, this is sort of in the order of like things it does really well to the, the things that um, use more work. Um, it has a really feature rich ecosystem. We, we work with a whole bunch of different global planners and Cartesian planners and inverse kinematics libraries and grasping libraries and um, a couple different collision checkers. And, and then also with perception and Octomaps, I, I said, this, this is oftentimes when you get into this space of not just doing a canned motion, um, one thing that's implied is that you're reacting to a changing environment. And that means some sort of perception system. And that perception system needs to feed into your collision environment so that you can plan within that environment. So Movit has tools for that. Why Rust2? Um, Rust2 is designed for production. Um, it shortens your time to market in a lot of ways. Um, Rust1 really, uh, in a lot of ways, Rust2 really is it's the authors of Rust1 um, got to a, a, a lot of people started using ROS for industrial applications. It had a lot of feedback and a lot of that went into a uh, redesign of some of the core pieces. And that's what ROS2 is. Um, it's multi-platform. It works on Linux, Windows, Mac OS. Linux, while um, Linux and Windows are um, tier one supported and Microsoft is putting a lot of money into making Windows work better, um, it, it is still, uh, the only real first class, uh, Ross environment is Linux. Um, and then now because of how they've abstracted executors and various other things, uh, you can do more, um, hard and soft real time type stuff. So let's talk.